This evening I want to talk to you about the archaeological evidence that relates to the New Testament. Uh, certainly not the archaeological evidence in terms of a complete rendition. We'd be here for a long time. But some of my favorite things that have been found, some of which I had some small part in, uh, that I know a little bit more about. Not that it's more significant than many other things that could be mentioned. But this would be a few of the things that uh, I have had some knowledge of that relate to the New Testament. I think it's especially important as we think of the responsibility that Peter emphasizes in 1 Peter chapter 3 when he commands always be ready to make a defense. That's the word apologetia. We get apologetics from it. You be ready to give reasons for your faith. There's another way to say that. To everyone who asks you to give an account for the hope that is in you, yet with gentleness and reference. We are to be ready. Uh, to those who believe the Bible, to those who don't believe the Bible. And more and more today we have those who don't believe the Bible and we need to be able to give a defense to those as well as did the apostles in New Testament times. Let's move quickly into examples of it. One of the most dramatic and uh, latest exciting examples of such evidence is here shown on the front page of Biblical Archaeology Review. This is an ossuary, a bone box, that pertains to the custom of the Jews in the first century, ended in 70 AD with the destruction of Jerusalem, began about the first part of that first century, and involved the burial laying on a shelf in a tomb and then coming back about a year later, opening the tomb gathering the bones, then uh, denuded of the flesh, and put into this uh, bone box uh, made of limestone, typically carved, about uh, 22 inches long on the average to accommodate the longest bone in the body, which would be the femur. They refer to it, this example as evidence of Jesus written in stone. The inscription on this ossuary says James, the brother of Jesus, uh, the son of Joseph, was also a part of it. When it was first announced back in 2002, Biblical Archaeology Review described it as being of breathtaking significance. Herschel Shanks, who's the editor of that journal, says it's the most important find in the history of New Testament archaeology. Well, maybe. Uh, it certainly would be in that category. Looking carefully at the corner, you can almost see from this view, uh, this uh, etching. Uh, a closer view is the Aramaic, which says James, son of Joseph, brother of Jesus. Almost all of the ossuaries have simply one name. Better than... 95% do. Very few have two names. Only two have been found that have three names, referring to the father as well as to a brother, and that was to uh, a high priest. This would indicate uh, it is of special significance, and uh, the combination of James and Joseph and Jesus, while common names in that era, the combination makes it extremely unlikely that it would be anyone other than the one obviously indicated. James, uh, we have several Jameses, I guess you'd say, in the New Testament. This one is the one that was the brother of Christ. He played a prominent role in the New Testament. We know that in the beginning he was an unbeliever. His brother said to him, leave here, go to Judea, so that your disciples may see your works. Verse 5 says, not even his brothers were believing in him. He did have more than one, as well as sisters, contrary to what some of our friends teach about Mary. But James was one of those brothers who didn't believe. He was persuaded by the evidence, by the overwhelming evidence of the resurrection of Christ. 
1 Corinthians chapter 15, in the list of appearances after his resurrection, we're told he appeared to James and to all the apostles. James was his brother. He really wanted James to see. Yes, he really was raised from the dead. In Galatians 1, Paul says he didn't see any of the other apostles except James, the Lord's brother, indicating that at this point he had become uh, significant and perhaps uh, somewhat prominent. In chapter 2, verse 9, recognizing the grace that had been given me, James and Cephas and John, who were reputed to be pillars, uh, gave to me Barnabas the right, and, and Barnabas the right hand of fellowship. In Acts chapter 12, Peter had been in prison and was miraculously released by the angel and came to those gathered uh, there at, at the, the household praying for him. And he said, uh, motioning with his hand to be silent, he described to them how the Lord had let him out of prison and he said, report these to James and the brethren. James needs all the evidence he can get perhaps. Uh, but make sure James knows this, and to the brethren. And then in Acts chapter 15, when there is the confrontation over circumcision, uh, various inspired voices spoke, and then James gave the conclusion. After they had stopped speaking, James answered, saying, Brethren, listen to me, which would show the prominent role that he was playing at this point. We know from tradition from history of his death, I think reliably. Here in the 13th century, we have a mosaic from the, a cathedral that wouldn't be all of that authentic uh, in and of itself, but it refers to testimony by Hegesippus, which goes back to 150 AD. Remember the book of Revelation was written about 96, so within a generation of the writing of the last book, we don't have Hegesippus today, but Eusebius did, and he was quoting from uh, Hegesippus in 316 from a, a document that had been written in 190 AD when he said, James was thrown from the pinnacle of the temple. When that did not kill him, he was stoned, and when that did not kill him, his head was stove in by Fuller's club. And these figures represent what uh, Hegesippus told us happened within one generation uh, from, the, from the life of the apostles. The pinnacle of the temple we referred to this morning briefly in connection in our class, in connection with the Garden of Gethsemane, but we're looking at the south wall of the Temple Mount as it appears today, a good bit of it having been rebuilt by the Crusaders, and this corner is the pinnacle. Uh, being much more precipitous before the rubble and the ruin of the destruction of Jerusalem down to the valley, straight down, rather than sloping, uh, which uh, is produced by the rubble. But this is the way it appears today. And from that point, uh, James was thrown off, didn't kill him, and then was killed by the Fuller's Club, according to the testimony of Hegesippus. We're looking at a larger view of that uh, south, uh, the pinnacle and the, the, the retaining wall of the temple. And the valley in between is the Kidron Valley. This is the pinnacle. Across the valley on the other side is the community that's today called Silwan. It is a Palestinian village. And it's built on a limestone uh, cliff uh, that forms the edge of that valley. And built into the cliff, we see a number of caves and enclosures that are tombs. And it was in one of these tombs that this ossuary was found, not far from the pinnacle, uh, which would not have been where he would have been buried immediately after his death, but within a year of his death. Well, is this a real artifact? There was a great deal of controversy, but the uh, geological, uh, or, or the Arche yes, the geological society there in uh, Israel looked at this to verify it and put out an official statement. Well, the, the, looking at the patina, this coating that forms over thousands of years, 
uh, this has to be authentic. Uh, and here we see uh, Professor John McRae, who is author of the uh, Archaeology in the New Testament, said six different pieces of patina, this coating that forms over years, of the stone looked at through the laboratory. It was verified by people who are not Christians that the date on this first century is the first century. There's no evidence of recent disturbance disturbances out of the box. And so those who were Jews who were not Christians authenticated this initially. In fact, Eric Myers, who's professor of Judaic studies, director of the graduate program of religion at Duke University, said, I have no question that it is an ancient artifact from the first century. However, as the implications began to sink in and people began to realize just what this means, direct evidence of James, the brother of Jesus, uh, there began to be a good deal of opposition. And the Dallas Morning News reported the action by the uh, uh, official archaeological body in Israel saying that this was not real. They found evidence of fraud, we're told that wasn't from scholars, it was uh, from those who had no expertise in the area. And uh, they came up with some 15 witnesses and brought charges against the one who was the, the one who possessed this. We need to put this in the context of archaeology in Israel. It's dominated by the minimalist fancy term that's given that's usually describing atheists who are viciously opposed to the Bible. We are familiar with that in this country, and it is true also in Israel. Uh, without archaeological proof, it's just not so. The absence of evidence is proof that it didn't happen. Uh, I don't think the absence of evidence proves that. Then there are those that I'll call the elitist, or that's typically the way they're described. And they uh, have uh, more uh, precise, more uh, authentic, uh, better archaeologists than anyone else because they will not accept any evidence unless it's providence, that is, under the official guidance of the Institute of Archaeology in Israel. Of course, that, the embarrassment to such a position is the Dead Sea Scrolls, the most famous find of all, and it was not provenanced. But that's their position, and really it's an excuse to deny evidence. All of that's exacerbated by the hatred between the Arabs and the Jews, especially on the part of the Arabs, I will say, in my experience. Um, this is the context in which this battle is being fought. <clears throat> but the owner of the ossuary was charged with forgery and then endured a seven-year trial together with another friend of his who was also charged with forgery. The verdict was just handed down March 14th of this year, not guilty, and reported here in Biblical Archaeology Review, the forgery trial of the century has concluded in a Jerusalem courtroom. Defendants have been acquitted of all major charges. And then we find the conclusion reported of all places in the Wall Street Journal that James Ossuary is what it seems the earliest recorded reference to Jesus of Nazareth. That's rather amazing. Now, that's not what everybody is saying. The minimal, minimalist, the elitist are saying very different things, but they're not justified. And the judge of the Jewish court, like the head of the Sanhedrin <laughs> has said, this is authentic. Uh, well, didn't say that, but the charges of forgery are false. <coughs> the Dallas Morning News reported this and said, well, yes, okay, this is evidence, very reluctantly, but it's the only evidence you got. <laughs> I'll admit you got this, but that's it. Uh, that's either abysmally ignorant or dishonest. Maybe both. I don't know. Why would I say that? Well, just from the standpoint of ossuaries, 
here is the ossuary of Caiaphas. That's in the text that we're studying in our class on Sunday morning, the high priest. We didn't quite get to him, but almost did this morning. This was found just recently, 1961, outside of Jerusalem. We see the temple mount, uh, the mound in the center there. We're out on the edge of town. They were actually excavating to build <laughs> a water park, water slides. And uh, they found tombs that they didn't know about. Here the map shows the location of the Caiaphas tomb. It looks like this. Uh, the rocks were hewn out. This is consistent with the practices in the first century of burial. This ossuary had a name carved on the end of it, and it was uh, Caiaphas, and very ornate. The ornateness of it would indicate this is a very important person. And even the elitist and uh, the minimalist have acknowledged, well, yes, this, this really is the tomb or the, the ossuary of Caiaphas. Then in 2011, June 29th, the granddaughter of Caiaphas, uh, her ossuary was found, and that likewise has been acknowledged by the Israeli uh, Department of Antiquities. Uh, traveling through Houston, last uh, year before last, in the Houston Museum was the display of the Dead Sea Scrolls included was another ossuary that has been found recently that has inscribed on it the son or Alexander who was the son of Simon of Cyrene. Well we recognize Simon of Cyrene as the one who carried the cross of Christ and in the text uh, in Mark chapter 15 we read uh, of Simon of Cyrene the father of Alexander well, that's the name that's on this ossuary, referring to Simon of Cyrene. Uh, notice the statement that's quoted in Biblical Archaeology Review. When we consider how uncommon the name Alexander was, uh, not Abraham or Isaac or Alexander, uh, and to note the ossuary inscription lists him in the same relationship to Simon as the New Testament does, and recall that the burial cave contained remains of people uh, from uh, Sarinthia, which is exactly what, uh, where he's supposed to be from. The chance that Simon on the ossuary refers to Simon of Cyrene mentioned in the gospel seems very likely. I think that's a, a very conservative statement. But we have all kinds of evidence. We, here are three ossuaries. The one they reluctantly acknowledge after a seven-year battle is not the only one and certainly not the only line of evidence. We're familiar, of course, with the story of Pilate and his treatment of Christ, that Pilate washed his hands, uh, supposedly removing any responsibility that he had and gave Christ over to be crucified, uh, sealing his uh, reputation of infamy. Is this a real story? Can we verify this? Well, historically, the answer would have to be yes. He is attested by Josephus, a first century historian who describes him in detail, by Philo, a first century Jewish philosopher, and by Tacitus, a first century Roman historian. They all mention him uh, rather prominently. But archaeological evidence of uh, Pilate was missing until 1961, when at uh, Caesarea Maritime, this inscription was found. It was actually being used as a step, and many inscriptions that are found in the New Testament are uh, stones that were reused after the original setting was destroyed, and they took that stone and used it for some other purpose. But now then, this uh, second building where this stone was used was being excavated and sure enough there is the inscription found. Uh, it says Tiberium Pontius Pilate, the perfect of Judea, which is uh, the official title of Pontius Pilate. How do you say this is a fictitious character? There's in stone the record together with the historians who testify. In Matthew chapter 2, we read of Herod the king. This is a prominent figure in the New Testament. 
And if you're going to say these are fictitious stories, you're going to have a really hard time with Herod because he left an indelible imprint. This, according to the representation of the artist of the time, is how he looked. We see coins that commemorate uh, with his likeness on it. You remember the story in Matthew chapter 2 that he tricked the wise men and then uh, killed all the children in and around Bethlehem who were two years old and under. This was not a good man by any means. Where do we have record of this? Well, uh, the records were destroyed uh, as an act of uh, disgust toward him. His name they attempted to wipe out because he was a terrible individual. But fairly recently, there was discovered what's been called the Chapel of the Innocents. Under a building of worship synagogue are literally hundreds of baby skeletons. Now, how and why would that happen? Unless somebody's out killing babies. We might understand that today, though these are not... Uh, uh, unborn children. These are one to two year old children. Uh, I think, it, and it does date to the first century, and I think we found evidence of exactly what happened under Herod. Herod has been described as a megalomaniac uh, because of the tremendous efforts to build and to leave a memorial to himself. The temple that was destroyed by the Babylonians was restored uh, by Ezra, Nehemiah, and probably looked something like this. Then during the Hasmonean period, the period between the Testaments, that was elaborated upon. Other buildings we know were put, upon, put there. And then the latter part of the Hasmonean, Hasmonean period uh, has a, a rather large extension. But that's nothing compared to what Herod did. We see here in the green section that uh, put the Solomon's porch, the porticos, uh, all of the elaborate uh, dwellings, and then we see over here on the uh, left-hand corner, forward left-hand corner, that uh, Antonio fortress we mentioned this morning where the Roman soldiers now live. They have an official place there with the temple. Looking something like this, according to uh, one of the better scholars of the New Testament, and I don't think that's an exaggeration. Almost every representation on that picture uh, we have verification of. Herod was, was quite a fellow. And from Josephus' description of Solomon's porch here, the interior looked something like this. We read in Mark 13, as he was going out of the temple, one of his disciples said to him, Teacher, behold, what wonderful stones, what wonderful buildings. And Jesus, of course, told them that it would soon be torn down, which did happen in 70 A.D. That's Herod. He's real. And we see evidence of him everywhere we look in the New Testament. One of the most obvious places is Caesarea Maritime, the spot where Pilate's inscription was found. It looks something like this. This is a representation from Reader's Digest. Um, and I think pretty accurate. This, these are some of the artifacts of the scenes today from the destroyed palaces and the swimming pools, the playgrounds of Herod. Uh, there was a 30-mile aqueduct that brought water to Caesarea Maritime. Uh, one of the more famous structures built by Herod was Mazada, where hundreds of Jewish individuals committed suicide as the Romans approach, not wanting to be killed by the Romans. One of the monuments to Herod is seen in what's uh, called Herodium today. It's an artificial mountain. He built his own mountain uh, using uh, almost unlimited slave labor uh, with fortresses built into it, actually with a synagogue on top, just in deference to the Jews, uh, not because of any sincerity. Um, but very well fortified, of course, uh, not uh, that well preserved, but well enough to get a pretty good idea of what was going on. And here is my beloved as uh, we look down from the upper portions of that uh, structure that was built 
by Herod. From the bottom, you see uh, uh, the, the Playboy playground, uh, the large swimming pool. In that swimming pool, he drowned his mother and three of his brothers and two of his sons. Not a nice fellow. From the ground, from the from the air, you can get an idea of what we're talking about. Josephus had an interesting description from Herodium. He said there were 200 steps of the purest white marble that led to it. That is his tomb. He built a tomb ready to bear, uh, receive him when he was when, when he died. Uh, its top was crowned with circular towers. Its courtyard contained splendid structures. Well, of course, history records that when he did die, uh, they didn't honor him as he had planned. In fact, he had ordered that 200 of the leading uh, aristocrats of the Jewish society be killed the moment that he died so that somebody would cry in Israel when he died. Well, he was dead, and so they ignored the order. <laughs> but that was an official order. His tomb was finally found, and the reason it had not been found, it was just beat to a pulp, and then another building built on top of it in Byzantine period. But it was found in 2007 by Ehud Netzer, whom we've worked with on a couple of occasions. After a search more than 30 years, uh, Ehud Netzer of Hebrew University says he's located the tomb at Herodium, a site south of Jerusalem. And you see below, uh, on, on the walls of that artificial mountain, uh, that tomb was built. The marble steps were going up to it. Uh, there was a very elaborate sarcophagus that they have put together in detail. It had been beat to pieces. It was in hundreds of pieces. They had, they had a jigsaw puzzle. Why do you think this uh, beautiful, ornate structure was beat to pieces? They didn't like him, and they wanted everybody to know that. His grandson was Herod Agrippa I. We read of him in Acts chapter 12. He put on royal apparel. Josephus says it was sparkly. We won't uh, relate that to some of the styles that we see <laughs> worn today, but anyway, he was trying to show off and actually at this point making claim to be divine took his seat on the rostrum, began to deliver an address, and the people kept crying out the voice of a God and not of man. And immediately an angel of the Lord struck him because he did not give God the glory and was eaten by worms and died. This is Herod's grandson. This is what he looked like, according to the artist who did his bust. We have a stone, uh, that is a coin also, that records his likeness. And uh, the statue uh, kind of looks like something's eating him, doesn't it? <laughs> uh, not in a good humor. Moving on to his great-grandson, we have Herod Agrippa II that we read about in Acts chapter 25. When several days had elapsed, King Agrippa and Bernice arrived at Caesarea, paid their respects to Festus. We have numerous coins that record the name Herod Agrippa II, which is the way he's described in Acts 25. Um, I think that was a real person. <laughs> what do you think? There's evidence of that. In Matthew 22, we find reference to a coin and the image of the emperor on that coin as they were asking Jesus about paying tribute to Caesar. And he responded saying, whose image and inscription is this? And they, they said to him, Caesar. They were referring to the Emperor Tiberius, who was the only one whose image was on a coin at that time, of a denarius, he said, of course, render to Caesar the things that are Caesar's. This is his, and you pay tribute to him. This is the coin. We have numerous examples of it, and uh, I guess we won't have Zenda stand up and model, but she's got one on a uh, necklace around her neck tonight. If you want to see it after services, you can look at it up close. That's the coin that Jesus held. Whose image is this? That's Tiberius Caesar. How do you not deny the reality 
of that. Just one thing after another verifies what we're seeing in the New Testament. In Acts chapter 13, Paul and Barnabas were traveling on what's sometimes called a missionary journey. They traveled to Cyprus. Verse 6 says they went on the island as far as Paphos and found a certain magician, a false prophet. Name was Bar-Jesus. Uh, and then uh, the proconsul Sergius Paulus, a man of intelligence or nobility. This man summoned Paul, uh, Barnabas, and Saul and, and sought to hear the word. And, of course, did respond. Verse 12, he believed when he saw what had happened. The miracles that had been performed was amazing at, amazed at the teaching of the Lord. And, of course, skeptics have said, well, this is just a story that's made up to give credibility where it didn't exist. Here's a prominent man that believed. Well, uh, but it's, it's just made up. Well, uh, it wasn't long ago, just uh, actually about 15 years ago, just outside of Paphos, the city referred to, we find this inscription, uh, and, by the way, another one similar at Rome, uh, where he came from, and it refers to Sergius, not Sergius, uh, that's obscured, but Paulus, who is the proconsul. They had also uh, derided the concept of proconsul. Who ever heard of a proconsul? Well, we have now stones that verify that was what the office was called, and that Sergius Paulus, uh, whom history records as well as archaeology, both at Rome and just outside of Paphos. On the uh, first missionary journey, they went from Cyprus, then uh, to Corinth, and began preaching there, and of course helped establish the church. Romans was written from Corinth, and in Corinth, uh, writing to the Romans, Paul says, Gaius, host to me and the whole church greets you. Erastus, the city treasurer, greets you, and Cortus, the brother. And again, skeptics have said, you know, what would the city treasurer do? Being converted to Christ, this, this is something they're just uh, trying to uh, use to give credibility, denying the reality of it. But among the ruins that have been found at Corinth in recent years are this, is this stone, a pavement stone. It refers to Erastus in return for uh, this word which refers, could be translated the, the treasurership, the, the office of treasurer, at his own expense, and they would assume the, the por portion that's missing says laid this pavement, laid this pavement at his own expense in return for his office of treasurer. There's the name. It dates to the period that we see Paul writing in the first century. Uh, Josephus also described him in detail and described him as a man of great dignity. He, uh, along with the rest of those at Rome, greeted the brethren at Corinth. In Acts 18, we read while Gallio was proconsul, here's that term again, which has now been verified, of Achaia. Achaia is the area that would include Corinth. Uh, he was proconsul of Achaia. The Jews with one accord rose up against Paul and brought him before the judgment seat. Now the term judgment seat is a play on words in the Greek from two terms that, that sound alike. I won't try to pronounce them. But this is the judgment seat at Corinth, which is uh, actually without contest. Uh, the, this is readily acknowledged to be the judgment seat. And here we find, well, it's kind of hard. You find this plaque that says judgment seat. <laughs> That's the translation of it. And so it's pretty obvious that this is where the judges sat. This is the Supreme Court of Corinth, so to speak. Uh, another scene shows the benches where the judges would sit and people who were accused came here to the judgment seat. And we see the Acropolis in the background and places where the judges sat then where those accused were brought. In verse 12, Gallio was proconsul of Achaia. They brought him 
uh, before the judgment seat. Uh, we find also, and, and, and of course, the, the question is, who is Gallio? Uh, nobody had heard of him. He wasn't uh, mentioned in history. He's supposed to have been, you know, since you, you have the negative evidence, that's proof against it in the minds of the elitist. Uh, but the absence of evidence is not evidence of absence. It's just evidence you hadn't found it yet. And then they did find evidence of Gallio in this inscription, which is now in Delphi, Greece. It's an inscription by the emperor, Claudius Caesar. Uh, and it is in the right period. He reigned from 41 to 54 AD. And it begins, to Gallio, my friend and co-consul. So both the office and Gallio, before whom Paul was brought to the judgment seat. Romans 14, of course, says we're all going to be where? Before the judgment seat of God, using this same term that was used to describe that before which Paul was brought. It was a term they would uh, know with dread at that time, and uh, it brings should bring serious concern to each one of us. Moving along in the book of Acts to the next chapter, Chapter 19, we get to Ephesus. If you're looking at cities that have been excavated that just bring awe, this is one of the greatest. Uh, though we find several others that are uh, gaining on it, <laughs> maybe have surpassed it, Laodicea being one. That is still in the process of being excavated. Acts 19 tells us in verse 34 that... Uh, there was a great deal of controversy as they opposed those who were making a living uh, selling these silver images of Diana. Uh, Paul said, this is no real God, and boy, they got upset. And they cried out for two hours uh, in, the, in the theater, in the big amphitheater there. Great is Diana of the Ephesians. Great is Diana. Well... Uh, she was pretty great, at least in terms of height and <laughs> rather amazing features. Uh, we think that uh, people in our society are, uh, have, have fetishes with women's breasts. They really carried that to an extreme. She just had all, all kinds of breasts. And she, this was a goddess of fertility and sexuality, and uh, that's what they worshipped. Uh, we find numbers of coins with that image on it, and this is one of the images that was found there at Ephesus. The Temple of Diana was truly one of the wonders of the world. Uh, you can almost see the scale of, when you look at the people, these columns were 60, 60 feet tall. Maybe you get some idea of that in what, remains today. They piled them up. Of course, they had fallen. But here's one column that they put together intact, and you see the little fellow standing down at the bottom of the column? That's me. <laughs> uh, pretty much dwarfed by the huge columns. I'm standing by uh, the top and the bottom. They've left out the center because it wouldn't fit in the museum there in the Museum of Archaeology in Istanbul. But this will give you the scale of one of those 60-foot columns from the Temple of Diana. Verse 29 says, The city was filled with confusion. They rushed with one accord into the theater and dragged along Gaius and uh, Aristarchus, Paul's traveling companions. Well, they drug them along uh, which street? <laughs> this is the theater. Here is the main street. And that, I don't know whether you could still see the heel marks, but that's where they drug them, down that street that uh, has been excavated and can be seen clearly today. There were shops along either side. And as you approach, you see more shops uh, and some of the ruins laid out here before the theater. Uh, but the grandeur of it was, was awesome. It would seat about 40,000 people. And that's where they were shouting, Great is Diana of the Ephesians. We're not making this up. 
here it is. Here's the place. Here's the street. They drug them down. And they refused to listen. I thought I'd see if they'd listen to me, but they didn't listen to me either. <laughs> uh, going back now to the early part of New Testament history to Luke 2, and I'm putting it here because this is a recent find. We know the story of Claudia, Caesar Augustus who took the census, and that's why Mary and Joseph were going back to Bethlehem uh, for the census to be taken at the order of Caesar Augustus, according to Luke chapter 2, verse 1, the story that we read each year. Well, we know all about Caesar Augustus. There's no doubt that there was such an individual. We have a number of busts that represent his likeness. Verse 2 says this was the first census taken while Quirinius was governor. That would imply it wasn't the only census, but the first one that was taken while Quirinius was governor. There were others. Now, some have documented at great length another one that wasn't at the right time. And they say, see, it wasn't at the right time. But this passage clearly indicates that there's more than one. But this was the one that was taken when Corinthius was governor. Well, who is Corinthius? Nobody ever heard of him until in Antioch of Presidia we found this stone uh, translated looks uh, reads something like this but describes as you see in the middle Corinthius who was unknown before this discovery and that discovery was about 20 years ago but more recently another document amazing documentation was found of all places in Venice how do you find evidence for the New Testament in Venice well what kind of soldiers were in Jerusalem? Roman soldiers. <laughs> Wouldn't they be from Venice and Rome and various places where Romans lived? This is a tombstone of a Roman soldier that was from Venice. Uh, of course, everybody can read <laughs> the Latin. No. But it reads like this. It refers to Secundus of the Pal Palestinian tribe, in the service of the divine Augustus, Augustus had claimed divinity and out of politeness they acknowledged him as divine. So he's under Augustus. Under uh, Corinthius, uh, the legate of Caesar in Syria, uh, and goes on to say he conducted a census by the order of Corinthius. So he's under uh, the Caesar, Caesar Augustus, he's under uh, Corinthius, who ordered the census. I, it, it just doesn't get better than that. <laughs> uh, in a very unlikely place, uh, Caesar Augustus ordered that a census be taken, the first census while Corinthius was governor <coughs> of Syria. Syria, Corinthius, Caesar Augustus, <laughs> all of it is documented in the tombstone of an obscure Roman soldier uh, from Venice. We know also Claudius Caesar, the one referred to in Acts chapter 11. Agabus stood up, showed by the Spirit there was going to be a great famine in the world, which happened in the days of Claudius Caesar. Well, we know all about him. Uh, they're very elaborate statues dozens of them, stone, uh, that is, uh, coins that show his likeness. Uh, this is another likeness. Uh, following him was Nero. Everybody, anybody heard of Nero? Uh, the one that fiddled while Rome burned, we're told. Actually, the fiddle wasn't invented till after that time, so that's probably a spurious account. But he certainly did persecute the Christians and burn them and impale them on stakes and covered them with pitch and used them for lanterns. It was a horrible individual, about 64 AD. Traveling to Rome, and some of our number will be going there soon, you'll want to visit this spot. Uh, now the upper portion is from a much later period. What we're looking at is this lower part that the later part was built on top of. This is the prison 
of Peter and Paul. And from uh, very uh, reliable and uh, acknowledged to be uh, real documents, this was uh, what we'd call death row in the first century, as early as 37, uh, A.D. 37. Uh, and certainly at the time uh, of Peter and Paul in the 60s. Somebody who was sentenced to death, this is where they would be. I have a friend who did his doctrinal dissertation on this prison and some of those records and uh, documented that thoroughly. One of the things that he turned up was this woodcut from 225 A.D. depicting the inside of the prison. Now that's not quite as early as 37, <laughs> but not far from the time. Uh, I think some things had been added. Perhaps the altar that we see here had been added by 225. The central uh, section here in the middle hides a staircase that you can see going behind it that was not there in the first century. It was added according to official records about 125 A.D. This is the way it looks today exactly as it did in the woodcut from 225 A.D. And here you see that added uh, wall in front of the staircase that allows you to come down. In the first century, that staircase wasn't there. How did you get in? Well, you see that hole in the ceiling? They just dropped them down. There was no staircase. There was a well. Uh, Catholic tradition says it was miraculously provided for Peter. Don't subscribe to that. Uh, but there is a well, and it's uh, where they kept those sentenced to death. In this uh, altar uh, that was in the woodcut at 225, we see the upside-down cross, which at least from 225 would verify uh, the tradition that, Jesus, that uh, Peter was crucified upside-down. The Bible doesn't. Uh, record that, but history rather reliably does. He didn't want to, he was going to be crucified. He refused to die the way he's, his Lord did. He didn't deserve that, and so uh, history indicates he was crucified upside down, as indicated then by this figure on the front of the altar, which is in the 225 A.D. Uh, woodcut. But you can go there today and look at that. Very few people go for some reason. They're, they, they just flock at the Colosseum and there are thousands of them. But you can stand here and get a picture all by yourself. I think it's an awesome place. Uh, it just gives chills uh, to stand there and to know there is reliable evidence. It was from here that Peter and Paul were taken and were killed. Clement records Paul's death in 95 A.D. Now this is one year before the writing of the book of Revelation, within the lifetime and the writing of the time of the writing of the last book of the New Testament. He says Paul was beheaded outside of Rome at the third milestone on the road to Ostia. He was there. He saw it. And he records his eyewitness testimony. This is the road to Ostia and the building that you see in the background there is built at the third milestone. And the stones that you see in the center here are the stones from that original road. He said he was beheaded outside of Rome. And uh, the, the Catholics there have memorialized that spot and painted this horrible scene uh, to remember Paul's being beheaded at the third milestone on the road to Ostia. That third milestone is there and has been preserved. This is the original. Uh, we read from Clement of Rome, weeping friends took his corpse, carried it for burial to the subterranean labyrinths, labyrinths the catacombs. When I visited the catacombs there, the uh, graduate student, the guide said, it's a myth that Christians ever use these for anything. Well, Clement of Rome in A.D. 95 didn't know that. He said that's where Paul was taken, where through many ages of oppression, the persecuted church found refuge for help uh, for the living and sepulchers for the dead. 
Uh, here is a scene that depicts Paul being carried to the subterranean labyrinths, the catacombs. That was under Nero, who followed Claudius Caesar. He was followed by Vespasian, who was the father of Titus. Titus was the general who led the 10th Roman legion to destroy uh, Jerusalem. Uh, and we know historically of all of these individuals, uh, this is what they look like. Looks rather brutish, doesn't it? In Deuteronomy 28, that's way, way before 70 AD. I mean, you're talking about thousands and thousands of years. Uh, Moses said, the Lord will bring a nation against you from afar. Or at least it's recorded in Deuteronomy. They had crossed, and, and here we are at the, the two mountains, Mount Gerizim, uh, Mount Ebal, the Mount of Blessing, Mount of Cursing. What's going to happen if you obey? Here are the blessings. What's going to happen if you don't obey? Well, the Lord will bring a nation against you from afar from the end of the earth as an eagle swoops down, a nation whose language you shall not understand. What was the symbol of the Roman Empire? What was the insignia emblazoned on their breastplates and on their helmets, the eagle? A nation from afar. They didn't understand Latin in Palestine. Uh, Jesus likewise prophesied in Matthew 24, and we have Mark's account, I believe, recorded from the Dead Sea Scrolls uh, from about 50 A.D. of an event that happened in 70 A.D. But Jesus said in Matthew 24, uh, the disciples came out, pointed out the temple buildings to him. He answered and said, Do you not see all these things? I say to you, not one stone here shall be left upon another which will not be torn down. These buildings are going to be destroyed. Moses said there's going to be a nation from afar as the eagle fly. It will destroy you. Jesus said, for wherever the carcass is, there the eagles will be gathered together in his description of the destruction of Jerusalem. He says it's that which was spoken of by Daniel. And Daniel spoke of that fourth world empire as he gave the image with the four different metals, finally the one of iron representing the fourth empire, the Roman empire. Both Moses and Jesus foresaw the coming of the Roman Empire to destroy Jerusalem. In 70 AD, that's exactly what happened. And they burned the temple and they looted it. They carried off the gold and they uh, left it in ruins and marched back to Rome with uh, the booty. As you go to Rome today, if you're ever there, be sure you look at the Arch of Titus. Titus was the one who led the army in the destruction of Jerusalem. And here is the memorial to his victory over, the, over Jerusalem. Uh, this is a testimony to the fulfillment of the prophecy of Moses and the prophecy of Jesus. Yes, it was fulfilled by Titus. And here it is, is his arch to memorialize that. And if you look under that arch, you see some rather amazing and obvious carvings. What's there? The menorah. What are they carrying out? These are the artifacts from the temple. Now the throng that goes through Rome have no idea about this. And you'll not find a guide that'll point it out. But there is the testimony that Titus fulfilled what Moses foresaw and what Jesus foretold. And that was done in 70 AD by Titus. And here's his arch to memorialize it. There's more about that that we don't have time to go into. But uh, very interesting evidence. Dallas Morning News says, well, this ossuary is all you got. We're 15 minutes past time to quit tonight, and we could go on and on. <laughs> There's tons of evidence. In addition, we have shown that there are ossuaries of Caiaphas, 
the high priest, of uh, the son of Simon of Cyrene and also the granddaughter, the monument naming Pontius Pilate, the mon many monuments to Herod the Great, the bust of Herod Agrippa the first, the grandson and then the great grandson, uh, coins uh, from Agrippa the second, image of Caesar on the tribute coin, the monument that names Sergius Paulus, the proconsul of Paphos, and then the pavement naming the treasurer of Corinth, Erastus, the theater in Ephesus, the images of Diana, the great, and then statues of Caesar Augustus and inscriptions naming Corinthius uh, in Syria, from Syria and uh, under Augustus, statues and monuments for Claudius, Caesar, Nero, Vespasian, and the Arch of Titus. But this ossuary is all you got. <laughs> I'm sorry. I'm just going to have to call that a lie. There's just no excuse for saying something like that. There, I mean, how do you miss the arch of Titus? That's verification of what we read in the New Testament. Peter says, be ready always to make a defense. We have ample defense. Uh, showing that it is simply not reasonable to say this was made up. We have verification over and over again, and we can give an account for the hope that is within us from fulfilled prophecy, from eyewitness testimony, as well as from archaeological evidence dealing with the Old Testament and with the New. If you're here this evening and haven't obeyed the gospel, you are without excuse. The evidence is overwhelming. Honest souls say that has to be true. And they respond with conviction, with faith. And we encourage you to do that this evening, confessing your faith, repenting of your sins, and being baptized into Christ. If you've wandered away, come back while we stand and sing.